everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming. Today we have Shlomo uh, Wagner here from the University of Haifa. Shlomo uh, did his PhD here in the Hebrew University as the president of uh, Yossi Aron, where he published his work about the circadian clock and neuronal uh, responses in the hypothalamic nucleus of the SCL in nature in 1997. Then he moved to one of the most famous labs in uh, Olfaction in Harvard, Dulac. As they got a position in Tyson University. Today he's going to talk about molecular and neuronal mechanism underlying social recognition and memory. Thank you for coming. Okay. That's a new thing. Uh, uh, clapping before the seminar. Uh, thank you for the invitation. It's always a great pleasure to come to Jerusalem. Wonderful city, really. Especially driving in Jerusalem is refreshing. Um, so I would like to uh, talk today about uh, uh, social recognition memory, which is obviously the uh, basis for all our uh, relationships that we have with uh, specific individuals like uh, friends, uh, colleagues, uh, foes, and uh, so on, and actually to all the uh, social orga organizations of, uh, of animals. And, um, there are uh, three main paradigms that we use in uh, rats and mice uh, for exploring social cognition memory. They all are based on the innate tendency of uh, rodents to explore or investigate novel social stimuli more persistently than they investigate familiar ones. And I will uh, present them uh, now because I'm going to use some of them during the uh, lecture. So the, most, the simplest one is called the social recognition. It's just two uh, meetings, two encounters of the subject with the same social stimulus. And we interpret uh, the reduction observed in the second encounter compared to the first one in the investigation time during the second compared to the first one as reflecting a memorization of the social stimulus. So the animal is not uh, interested so much in the familiar animal as compared to the same animal when it was a noble one. A, a flavor of this uh, paradigm is called the social discrimination. Here we let the animal meet for the f uh, uh, with the animal for the first time, and then we let it uh, choose between novel and, and the same stimulus, a novel stimulus and the same stimulus during the social discrimination test, and we uh, interpret the uh, preference of the novel stimulus as reflecting memory towards the familiar stimulus. And the last one is called the habituation dishabituation test. Here we let the animal meet with the same social stimulus for several ta consecutive times, separated usually by uh, 20 to 30 minutes. And we see very strong habituation in the, the investigation time towards this uh, specific social stimulus to make sure that this is a social specific um, um, uh, or, or uh, habituation to all these uh, specific social stimulus, we let the animal in the last encounter to meet with a novel stimulus, and usually we see restoration of the investigation time to the original value. Okay, these are the uh, main paradigms. Yes. These are days or These are encounters. Now, the encounters can be separated either by short time, and then we are talking about shorter memory, or even by a day or, say, or a week, and then we are talking about long-term uh, memory. How do you quantify the investigation time? Well, you, uh, you need either, I'll show you in a minute, but you can do it either, or uh, traditionally people were uh, using observers. And we, are, we used to do, to, uh, we used a blind observer, observe, I mean blind, I mean blindly, uh, observers, three observers, observers and then um, uh, average them and get uh, results. Today we can u you can use it, especially in this uh, paradigm, because the animals are uh, confined to, uh, to small corrals. You can use a computerized system. I'll show you in a minute. How. You have to define. You have to define, but okay, if you will see. We'll see. Okay, we'll see an, an example in the sheet. Okay, so now, animals are endowed with specific or special or dedicated sensory channels and processes dealing with social uh, information because social information is, one, 
very important. Second, very predictable. Okay, we know if there is something the nature knows about an animal is that it's going to sometime meet a conspecific and it, it knows exactly what this conspecific is going. Conspecific, I mean, uh, the sa animal from the same species, species how it's going to be, uh, to look like. So in, a, in, in humans, it's a, a face processing a, or the, a detection. In a, in a bird, it's a song a, a recognition. And in, a, in a rodents, it's a mainly the main factor, the accessory factor system or the vomeronasal system, which is shown here, starting with the vomeronasal organ, which is a, equipped with receptors which buy, that bind very strongly pheromones and semi-chemicals, chemicals which are released by one individual and detected by, a, by other individual and transfer information between them. And the information is then going to many stations. In parallel, the main olfactory system is also detecting these molecules and also process the information and tran transfer them to many station, stations in the brain. But the core of the network, which is a thought to process uh, the information re relevant to social recognition memory is shown here. So we have the more more nasal organ in the main olfactory epithelium, innervating the accessory factory bulb and the main olfactory bulb. And the center of the network is the medial amygdala, which is getting information from both the accessory factory bulb and the main olfactory bulb, either directly or indirectly through the piriform and cortical amygdala and so on. And this uh, area is then uh, transferring the information to the lateral septum. From there, it goes to various uh, brain cen centers, uh, such as the hippocampus. But the medial amygdala is considered, I think, at least by us, to be at the center of this uh, uh, network. Now, not only uh, we have a dedicated network for, this, uh, for social information, <coughs> actually social recognition memory depends upon the um, activity of several neuromodulators. Of them, the most famous or uh, studied are uh, the uh, neuropathisial hormones, oxytocin and vasopressin, twin neuropeptides that are very similar to each other, actually a duplication of genes. They both are synthesized mainly in, in the two hypothalamic nuclei, the supraoptic and paraventricular nuclei. In each one of these nuclei, there are non-overlapping populations of magnocellular neurons which express uh, each one of these uh, peptides. They send the information, uh, I mean, the, the peptides are released in the, uh, to the blood for the hypophysis, but also from the PVN to many uh, brain areas, and there are many brain areas which uh, express the oxytocin receptor, uh, and we are going to um, talk about it um, today. Now, it was shown very clearly that Social recognition memory absolutely depends on the activity of both oxytocin and vasopressin. What you see here, these are wild type mice. You see the habituation, this habituation paradigm. But in, no, in oxytocin knockout mice, mice that do not express the oxytocin uh, gene, they do not show any type of uh, uh, any memory, any uh, short term uh, social recognition memory. And they treat the animal, the familiar animal, the animal which is presented to them again and again, as if it was a new animal uh, every time it, they, meet, they encounter the same uh, social stimulus. Now, it was shown that if you inject um, oxytocin to the median amygdala of these, uh, of these mice, you can restore this uh, memory. So it, uh, it is thought that oxytocin activity in the median amygdala is the crucial factor which uh, permit uh, the creation of uh, social recognition memory. And this experiment actually is the experiment which convinced me that social recognition memory, unlike other types of memory, is, a, is, a, um, a, un, is underlined or a, rely on a dedicated network and specific mechanisms which, are, which treat only with this memory because, because these mice do not show any impairment in any other type of memory. They have regular spatial, uh, odor, um, uh, and other types of memory, they are impaired specifically in social recognition memory. Now, likewise, these are mice which lack the uh, V1A receptor of vasopressin, and they also do not show social recognition memory, but the, the, this memory can be restored if the, this receptor is overexpressed in the lateral septum by viral injection. So 
it seems again as if there is a, a vasopressin activity in the lateral septum, in very specific center of this network, is a, responsible for a social recognition memory. Okay? So we have a dedicated network. We have a specific a, a mechanisms, molecular mechanisms, modulators, which, a, which are responsible or a, required for this type a, of memory. And a, this is, I'm not going to talk about this a, research to date. It was just published in a, this week in Eli. What I want to take is what, just one piece of the puzzle from here. So here we recorded from a, a rats performing the, the habituation, this habituation paradigm. From these five brain areas, we recorded a local field potential and also multi-unit activity. You can see the local field potential uh, here. That's the paradigm. You see the base before uh, any social stimulus is presented, and then the same social stimulus four times, and then a novel stimulus in the fifth time. This was done by my student Alex Tender. And what we, sh we found is that in all recorded brain areas, there is a very strong tetarhythmicity theta during the social encounters. This is a, the PSD analysis give a very strong peak in all brain areas at around 8 hertz. And um, what we also found is that this tetarhythmicity starts even a little bit earlier than the presentation of the stimulus itself uh, into the cage and lasts for, for actually several minutes after the stimulus is taken away from the arena. Okay, you see here the menor factory bulb, the lateral septum, and the medial amygdala all acquire very strong tetrarhythmicity, uh, which uh, persists even after the stimulus is no longer in the cage. So it's, uh, in, with, with this and other uh, evidence, we showed that uh, this tetrarhythmicity is not a matter of in the investigation behavior itself. It's a matter of a, an internal set of arousal, which is induced in the animal by the social stimulus. We also showed that this arousal state is proportional, in order, and at least the theta rhythmicity is proportional to the novelty of the social stimulus. So here you see uh, the PSD in the medial amygdala, okay, recorded, uh, measured in the medial amygdala for all, uh, all the stages of this habituation, dishabituation uh, paradigm. You see that before, during the base, before there is any uh, stimulus in the cage, there is a very small a, uh, I mean, the, a low level of power in the in this uh, in the eight hertz arrhythmicity, and then we go to very high level when the uh, social stimulus is introduced for the first time, and then we go b down second time, third time, fourth time, and then we go back to higher level when a new a novel social stimulus is introduced. And we uh, here you can see this uh, analysis plotted as a function of the encounter uh, number, and in parallel to the investigation time itself. So, the tetarhythmicity, the arousal, which is induced in the animal by the social stimulus, is proportional to the novelty of the social sti stimulus. It's getting down with the familiarization of the uh, stimulus. Now, what I want to take from this experiment, which, I mean, we developed, uh, developed a lot in the paper, is that the interpretation of us is that the, that the animal is uh, alert, uh, the, the, this state is a state of alertness. Okay, the animal meets a novel social stimulus for the first time, and as you all, I think, feel when you meet a novel or person or a new person for the first time, there is some kind of suspicion or uh, alertness. You don't know whether it's a good guy, is it a bad guy, is it going to, to treat me well, is it going to fight with me, does, it ha does it, he have a very a nice, a good, strong, a good uh, sense of humor? All kinds of things to be worried when you meet with the first, uh, for the first time with a, a conspecific. Okay, so the animal has the same worries. Okay, it, it feels some kind of alertness, and as it gets familiar with the uh, social stimulus, it's less worried. It's, uh, alert, its alertness is getting down, and all, all kinds of other behaviors can, uh, can start to develop. Okay. Now we go to the uh, research that I'm going to show you today, and uh, we wanted to uh, deal with the mechanisms which are responsible for the long-term uh, memory, and for that we adopted the social discrimination test in two flavors. Okay, here we have the short-term social uh, discrimination. We let the animal uh, encounter a social stimulus within a corral for five minutes, then 30 minutes later we let it choose between the novel 
a novel and the, so, and the familiar stimulus, usually we get a very strong a preference toward uh, the novel stimulus. The long-term paradigm is a little bit uh, different. We let the animal stay for one hour in the cage with the social stimulus, and then 24 hours later, we let, we, we ask, uh, we let it choose between uh, investigating a novel or a social stimulus, a, 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 or the familiar stimulus, and all, a, a, we also get a clear preference toward the novel stimulus. It looks today in our uh, new se system, which is designed by us, it looks like this. These are mice, of course, not rats, but you can see that we can detect exactly when is the animal investigating the social stimulus, which uh, sit here, uh, either this stimulus or this stimulus. We can do it automatically using computerized system, and then uh, the results are very uh, straightforward. But in the, uh, the results that I'm going to show you today, most of them are done uh, using uh, uh, observers. As I told you, a blind analysis, three observers, the average of the uh, results. Okay, so in order to, uh, to understand, so we ask, where are the molecular changes? We know that long term, Memory is uh, underlined by all kinds of molecular changes or molecular processes, such as protein synthesis and so on. And we, first, we wanted to locate them and to know where do, do they uh, uh, happen. And, to, and we, we assume that the medial amygdala as the center of this net network would be a good candidate to start with. And we, we, we checked how blocking protein synthesis in the medial amygdala influence the, either the short-term or the long-term a social recognition memory. We have done that by injecting anisomycin, a very specific blocker of a protein synthesis, to the medial amygdala. What you see here, so that's the design of the experiment, habituation to the cage, then injection of either cell line anisomycin, habituation again, a, a meeting with the juvenile, juvenile, which is the social stimulus, then habituation of 30 minutes and discrimination test. This is the short term. You can see that the animals uh, prefer the, uh, the novel uh, compared to the familiar. In both cases, either saline or anisomatic injection, it doesn't make any change to the, um, to the uh, short-term social cognition memory. But when we look on the long-term social cognition memory, anisomatic injection into the medial amygdala completely blocks the long-term memory. So we can say that a so long-term social cognition memory relies on protein synthesis in the medial amygdala. Now, we wanted to check whether we can uh, get another uh, process which is known to be associated with a, a long-term memory, synaptic plasticity in the medial amygdala. So what we've done is a very uh, simple uh, or methodology. We recorded a vogue field potential in the medial amygdala in response to a electrical shock or electrical activation of either the accessory olfactory bulb or the main olfactory bulb and uh, in anesthetized rats. And we got these type of signals that can be uh, for a strong, uh, getting from a stimuli which are getting stronger with a amplitude. Uh, these are very similar in the early phase, which seems to be monosynaptic because of the delay between the stimulus and the peak of the uh, response. But then we have a second phase only in the AOB stimulation. We don't see it with MOB stimulation. This is probably something which is coming back uh, from a higher uh, brain centers. And we, we looked at this, at the amplitude of this response, and we applied tetanic verse stimulation to the AOB in order to induce synaptic plasticity the same way people are doing in the hippocampus. Usually they get long-term potentiation. In this system, however, we got small but significant long-term depression after the tetanic burst stimulation, after the induction of a um, synaptic plasticity. That's the response that we get. Furthermore, when we applied oxytocin to the ventricles, to the third ventricle, just a few minutes before the tetanic burst stimulation, what we got is a very, is a very strong enhancement of the long-term depression. And this enhancement, the enhancement of the long-term depression was, a absolute, was completely blocked by an <coughs> injection of an antagonist of the oxytocin receptor. So it's specific to the activity of the oxy of oxytocin. So what, yeah? It's depression of what, curiosity? No, the depression of the synaptic response or ah, the, yeah. of the evoked response that we measure 
in the AOB in response to uh, in the middle amygdala in response to AOB stimulation. Okay, so you see it here uh, with more uh, with the Z score. Uh, you see uh, it here with the mean uh, value of the uh, response after the potentiation. You see the traces, and it seems as if we get uh, after tetanic based stimulation, we get an oxytocin dependent long-term depression of the synaptic response in the middle amygdala to AOB stimulation. We then checked it, what happened when we are using MOB stimulation and we got nothing. So this synaptic plasticity, this type of synaptic plasticity in the AOB seems to be pathway dependent. We get it from, by using the uh, excita or stimulation of the AOB, but not by using stimulation of the main olfactory valve. Now you can ask, I guess you, ask, you all ask yourselves, how do you know that this is because of the titanic burst stimulation? It may be because of the application of oxyto oxytocin. Maybe oxytocin by itself is, use, is doing this uh, long-term depression and you don't need actually the uh, input from the uh, accessory olfactory valve. So we checked what happened when we apply oxytocin without stimulation of the accessory olfactory valve and what we got is actually long-term potentiation of the same synaptic response or the same response when we, there is no tetanic bell stimulation. So only the coincidence of the tetanic bell stimulation and the presence of oxytocin in the, mid, in the, in the brain cause the long-term depression of the uh, evoked field potential. Now, we of course assume that this is the actually mimicking the situation during social encounter because, because during social encounter, we know that oxytocin is released from the paraventricular nucleus to the um, to the brain, to all, all kinds of stations in the brain, including the medial amygdala. We know that during this encounter, there is a lot of uh, stimuli arriving from the vomeronasal system, the accessory factory uh, system, and we assume that this would mimic the uh, coincidence of oxytocin and tetanic bell stimulation that we, uh, that we uh, found to cause long-term depression. But we, of course, we have to, to show it. We have to show the connection between the a social cognition memory and the long-term depression. And the way we choose to do that was by applying tetanic bell stimulation to the AOB of rats, of behaving rats, just before the exposure to the social stimulus for the first time, before the training session of the memory. And the reason, I mean, the reasoning was that if we saturate the synapses in the AOB in the middle amygdala, I'm coming from AOB to the middle amygdala, in a non-specific way, by LTD, by applying tetanic bell stimulation, which would cause LTD. If we do that, we would prevent these synapses or these animals from acquiring a social stimulus-specific memory because they cannot, they actually, from the, from, for them now, every animal is, is known, is familiar, because we, we induced LTD in all these synapses. Okay? So you can see this experiment here. Habituation, tetanic bell stimulation, another habituation, then exposure to the juvenile, 24 hours of in the home cage, and then again habituation and discrimination test. This is a control experiment. It was done with the same animals after, after the implantation of the electrodes to the AOB. They can, without tetanic bell stimulation, they can, they can acquire long-term memory with no problem. If we in, when we apply the tetanic bell stimulation to the AOB, they do not acquire, they do not form long-term long social recognition memory. If we wait then several days later and do the, again the same experiment, we do get long-term memory, so we didn't destroy the system. The system is still working. It just couldn't remember the animals immediately fo following the titanic burst stimulation. Now you can see here this analysis of the same results, and the interesting thing is that here it seems as if the animal is treating both stimuli as if they are familiar stimuli. And that's actually exactly what we expected. We expected that due to the saturation of all synapses with tetanic bell stimulation, the animal would now consider every, every animal as, as a familiar animal because all the channels, all the sensory inputs are uh, depressed. Now, the, uh, what are, uh, just to control, the same treatment of tetanic bell stimulation did not interfere with acquisition of short-term social cognition memory. So it's not that the a, a middle amygdala got um, a stormy and some, it does not, cannot process information anymore. Short-term memory can be induced, but not long-term social memory. 
and of course, and it, it does not interfere with acquisition of long-term auto memory. So just to make sure that long-term memory overall is is fine. Now, what what does it mean? Yeah. No, but we 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 uh, assume that unlike the situation in the anesthetized rat, okay, which is in, in a way oxytocin is not released for a, for a long time before before the uh, tetanic burst stimulation. Here, the animal is in the cage. It's it's probably has some kind, some level of uh, oxytocin in its uh, brain. Uh, now, there is what what does it mean? And I, I want now uh, to to think about it. Okay. We used to think about memory as a trace of strengthened synapses, okay, such that the same stimulation, in the next time we meet the same stimulus, it would cause us higher activity, stronger activity, more excitation in these synapses. Okay? What, how, what does it mean a memory which is based on depression of synapses, of, on, on weaker synapses? Okay, that's the, the question. And, and here I'm, I'm going to speculate, something which I like to, to do a lot. But the speculation is going like that, okay? And, and I'm using the information that, that we got from the recordings from the animals, okay? The alertness, okay? You rem remember arousal, tetrarhythmicity, alertness uh, because of the social stimulus. The animal is, is, is actually, the, the alertness is caused by stimuli which are arriving from the vomeronasal system. There are some external uh, evidence, of, uh, external. So that, there are many evidence showing that the vomeronasal system is in a way associated with stimuli which are a, may cause alertness. For example, Catherine Dulac uh, uh, showed that most maybe of the receptors in the vomeronasal system are dedicated to a sense a K hormones, pheromones which are released by predators. Okay, and predators of course should cause some alertness in the animal. And if we, uh, we uh, activate the same channel, it may be associated also with alertness for uh, conspecifics. And what we think is that the investigation, the intense investigation of the social stimulus by the subject is caused by these stimuli which cause alertness and arousal and, uh, and, and the animal want to get familiar, want to get release of this, uh, re uh, of this alertness and that's why it investigates the animal to, to check it, to recognize it, to make sure that it's not, a, it's not a bad thing, it's not a bad guy. Okay, that's, that's what happens here. And when, you, um, when the animal is remembered, the uh, excitation which is caused by these stimuli is getting down because of the long-term depression. So the next time we meet with the same animal, it will not cause a strong uh, uh, activity in the accessory factory system. Because, they, they, again, the synapses are inhibited, are depressed, and then uh, they will see less alertness, and maybe other stimuli coming from the mental factory system and from, uh, from the visual and, and auditory system will cause other types of behavior to, to develop. Okay, that's the, idea, that's the idea, I think, in this memory. So we, what we see here, in a way, is, is calming of the alertness, which is caused by the novel stimulus, um, because the stimulus is now familiar. So if you introduce a bad guy, mm -hmm. so each time the mouse starts to be the next Yeah, okay. So if this is true, this is true, okay, then I, I, I told my students, I expect that if you, if you encounter some really uh, annoying person, okay, you would, uh, you, would, you would, in the next time you meet him, you'll be even more alerted. Okay, or at least as alerted as you have been in the first time. It should be. I mean, that's why we, we are experienced with people. Okay, some people we are getting, they are really nice guys, we are really familiar, uh, familiar and we, we love them, they are friends, we, we, we take a beer together. And some people we, are, we, we would like to avoid and we, we are really uh, alerted by, by their presence. Okay, we need some kind of system which would uh, flip this, uh, this response. Can we find this system? And we look for such a modulator, which would cause the, uh, such, such a result. And we thought about the CRF receptor. There are several neuropeptides which, which are uh, uh, associated with the uh, CRF receptor. CRF itself, your protein 1, 2, and 3, and they are acting through two receptors, the CRF1 and CRF2 
uh, receptors. Now, you, the amygdala, amygdala, as you can see here, is one of the very few areas in the brain which strongly express the urocortin-3 neuropeptide. And not only that, it is endowed with a relatively high levels of the CRF2 receptor. The receptor. Okay, so maybe your cortin 3 and the CRF2 are, is this, are um, comprising a system which change the uh, response of the medial amygdala to stimuli arriving from the uh, AOS, even in the presence of oxytocin, if this kind of person is really annoying. So how can we check that? So wh what we have done is to apply your cortin 3 to the ventricles before oxytocin to see how, to, how, they, how they work together, and this is what we got, okay? Oxytocin, tetanic gas stimulation in the presence of oxytocin, tetanic gas stimulation in the presence of oxytocin and urocortin. Okay, so we get, so the urocortin is actually flipping the response of the medial amygdala to the, to the uh, stimuli or stimulation or strong stimulation of the uh, AOB. It's making a long-term potentiation of the signal which we predict would cause at least destruction of the social recognition memory or prevent the reduction in investigation time and the next time is going to make the same stimulus if not actually making it higher. So we checked it. We checked it by injecting your cortin 3 directly to the medial amygdala bilaterally uh, before the uh, animal is expo exposed to the um, social stimulus for the first time and this is what we got. This is with a uh, saline, the animals responded very well, but with a uh, your coating, the animal did not show any kind of social recognition memory. And if I um, and if I see right, actually in many cases the animal uh, responded with more investigation time to, towards the familiar stimulus as compared to the novel mind. At, le at least the, the animals which showed very strong learning here, they also showed actually opposite learning here. This is something we have to uh, to clear out, but at least from, from these animals, we can see, we can sh say that your cortin 3 in the medial amygdala during, just before the um, exposure training with a novel social uh, stimulus does not, is not good for the memory. The animal will, will not show reduction in investigation time in the next time it's going to meet with the same animal. Okay? Yes. Mm -hmm. Only one of them shows no response. Yeah, but you see this one, for example, uh, no, this one, for example, show no response here, no response here. I don't know. I mean, it's, it's a... But did you try to separate... Uh, the two groups. The groups to see if... No, we didn't do this uh, type of analysis yet. I mean, th th these are quite preliminary results, but we, we will keep this... Uh, yeah. Ah, they may have different... Yeah attitudes and this, you know, you're right. I mean, we have to start to personalize this uh, response, yeah. Right. Okay. So this is the, the end of the first section of the uh, um, lecture. And what I want to show you is very briefly what happened in a, in a knockout, in Shang-3 knockout, a rat. Okay, so Shang-3 is a um, protein, scaffolding protein, which is active in glutamatergic synapses all over the brain, the shank proteins, actually. Shank 3 is actually expressed in, expressed in specific uh, areas like the amygdala, medial prefrontal cortex, hippocampus, uh, striatum, and so on. And, uh, shank, and mutation in, thang, in shank 3, uh, haploinsufficiency, is caused monogenic form of, uh, of autism spectrum disorders. It's one of the best models. Of, a, of monogenic or syndromic uh, autism, one uh, between 0.5 to 1 percent of ASD cases are cases of uh, PMS, which is the Phelan McDermott syndrome, which is caused by Shank 3 mutation, a, a, a haplo insufficiency of the Shank 3 gene in, in human. Okay, and there are there are several labs which created a mice models for the Shank 3 a, mutation, but we were luck, a, lucky enough or fortunate enough to get the first model of a uh, chunk 3 knockout rats. Actually, the first model of monogenic uh, autism in rats from a, a, um, our collaborator, Joseph Buxbaum in Mount, Mount Sinai. Okay, so that's the, the way they 
uh, knocked out the gene. Several stop codons in uh, action six uh, within the anchoring doma domain of the gene. You can see uh, the level of expression of sanctuary wild type, much, much less in heterozygotes and nothing in knockout uh, rats, which are, of course, the homozygotes. And now we looked for the phenotype, okay? And the, our collaborators already have phenotyped the general social behavior and found no difference between the a wild type and knockout rats in social play, general social behavior, non-social behavior, and nothing which resembles what is known about uh, autism and so on. They were quite disappointed, and that's why they sent us the animals to, to, to check, check it in our end. And we started with uh, analyzing using social preference, okay? whether they choose a social a stimulus or an object stimulus, and they showed all of the genotypes showed perfect a social preference, no a difference between them. They also showed intact short-term social memory, okay? No difference between the three genotypes. But they showed complete abolishment of long-term social recognition memory, okay? So these are the wild types, and already the heterozygotes do not show any type of long-term social recognition memory. Okay, so we found a phenotype, and now we wanted to check whether is it possible that oxytocin application to these animals just before they, uh, are, te they are trained with the social st stimulus for the first time, does it restore the uh, social memory? And um, just uh, ah, a one, one thing before, they, these, we wanted to check whether it's a, a general problem with long-term memory or something re, uh, specific to, um, to social memory. So we tried two paradigms of hippocampal-dependent long-term memory, two very nice uh, paradigms, the uh, uh, object location, de de location-dependent object recognition, and they show very nice, uh, very good uh, memory. Contextual fear conditioning, there is intact memory, so there is no problem with general long-term memory, just with social long-term memory, memory. And here we applied oxytocin to the animals just before the um, exposure to the uh, ju uh, juvenile. And what you see is that saline injection does not change the uh, uh, behavior of the animals. They do not show memory, but oxytocin uh, uh, injection uh, caused them to show long-term social recognition memory in the heterozygote and homozygote uh, uh, rats uh, as well, um, 24 hours after the uh, exposure. So, so it seems that this oxytocin application may uh, rescue the phenotype of these uh, rats, and uh, it may even be used as a treatment for a PMS uh, patients. Uh, uh, Joseph uh, is now uh, have made patent of, uh, of it, and so on. And the last uh, thing I would like to talk about, how many time do I have? How much time do I have? Sorry. Yeah. Um, okay. So the last thing is, is related to, so, to social isolation, okay? And I, 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 uh, in a way, I, I, um, I didn't tell you all the truth in the introduction. Because for many, since 82, when this, the social recognition paradigm was invented, till 2000, it was thought that social cognition memory is only a short term memory. Well, I can, uh, you can read here from the, a very influential uh, review by Ferguson, Larry Young, and Thomas Inzel. These are very strong uh, researchers in the field. And already in 2002, they wrote that, 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 that was the common sense in the field that this memory can last for only 30 to 60 minutes. Not for more than that. It's only a short term. Nobody knew why. But uh, that's what they, uh, everybody found. But at 2000, uh, in the uh, lab of, uh, of Falcino Silva, they found out that actually it can be a, a, for a long-term memory can be formed if the animals are kept in, gr in group housing. Because what all the uh, uh, researchers have done beforehand was to take the animal to isolate it for at least one day or several days before the experiment to make it more hungry for social interactions. And, the, and, and we also found, as I told you, that the, we, can very, we can find a long uh, social cognition memory even three hours after the first encounter. And here we are using three consecutive encounters with the same social stimulus. And then one day or seven days after this uh, uh, training session, we can get a, a long-term social cognition memory. 
And when we compared, in, compared a grouped animals to isolated animals, indeed what you see here is that grouped animals does not care whether it's 30 minutes, 60 minutes, or two hours between the two intervals they show, between the two encounters, they show a very uh, significant reduction in the second encounter as compared to the first one, but isolated rats, they do acquire short-term memory, but after two hours there is no uh, difference between the two investigation time between the two encounters, so they cannot form long-term uh, social recognition memory because of the isolation. Now, it was this, we, we asked ourselves whether it's because uh, the problem is impairment, which is in, induced is in the acquisition or the retrieval phases of the memory, okay? So the, uh, to check that we've compared three uh, animals with the same, three groups of animals with the same procedure. Okay, we have here three uh, consecutive meetings with the same social stimulus, and then we compare these stimulus with a novel one, one day later, and, six day, and then seven days after the training session. But we do it with three groups. One of them was held in a group housing. You can see that they show very strong, I mean, the, R, the RDI, the relative duration of investigation, the higher it is, the stronger the memory is. So they sh show very strong memory uh, one day and seven days after the acquisition of the memory. The isolated animals, animals that were isolated for one week before the experiment, they do not, sh do not show any memory. But the animals that were, that after this training session were delivered into social isolation and checked again one day and seven days later, they do show a social recognition memory, even though, even after seven weeks in social isolation. And this tells us two things. One of them, the problem is in the acquisition, not the retrieval, but because the acquisition was in group, house, in group housing, while the retrieval was seven days in, into social isolation. And another uh, thing it shows is that the isolated rats do show novelty seeking. Okay, it's not that they have a behavioral problem and they don't care if the animal is familiar or not familiar. They cannot acquire social recognition memory, but animal that was uh, memorized earlier before the social isolation can be, they do tell between them and they do prefer uh, the novel stimulus upon the, uh, over the, over the uh, familiar one. Okay, and then the question was, what is the time cost? of this impairment in social recognition memory, which is being induced by social isolation. And you see here three meetings, okay? So I, I, told, I, I've sh I showed you that two hours are enough to tell between grouped animals and isolated animals. Okay, grouped animals can make memory, you know, isolated animals cannot make memory. So what we do here are a separating the two, the two encounters with the same stimulus by two hours, and then check again a novel stimulus uh, 30 minutes later. You see, these are the same animals held, held in different conditions and checked again and again with the same paradigm using a new stimuli every time. So during group housing, they are just fine. They do show very nice memory. Already 24 hours after it was so in so into social isolation, the memory is negligible, is very small. There is a very strong impairment in the social recognition, long-term social recognition memory, already 24 hours following social isolation. And that's, and that's very important because we, I mean, many, many of you, I guess, that work with rodents are doing cannulation, recordings with uh, chronic electrodes and so on. You do a surgery and then you usually put the animal into a cage by its own, a solitary cage, to, to keep it out of a touch of any other animal. But we have to, to understand that the animals are changing while they are in social isolation, okay? And, and then seven days later, they are still without any memory. We put it back into group housing. They do not show memory one day later, but seven days later, they restored their memory, so there, this impairment is reversible. It's not a permanent uh, impairment. And then, what is the mechanism? Where does it happen? Where, where is this impairment take, take, takes place? And we got back to the medial amygdala, to the same uh, synaptic response in the medial amygdala to AOB stimulation, to the synaptic plasticity, which is induced by coincidence between oxytocin re presence and tetanic bell stimulation, and we got no response, no synaptic plasticity in the isolated animals as compared to a new group of, uh, of uh, a, a grouped animal. 
So it seems as, as if, as, as early as the medial amygdala already here, there is maybe even in the AOB, but already in the middle, in these early stations, the some molecular processes which are, um, which are responsible for a long-term memory are not working anymore. Long-term memory cannot be, uh, cannot be formed uh, because of this lack in synaptic plasticity. And the last thing that we have done is that we took it to molecular profile. So we isolated the medial amygdala of group of isolated animals at certain time points following social isolation. We did high throughput sequencing of the mRNA and we compared them to a, a grouped a, a animals, to control animals, and we got a, a not so long list of about 100 genes which showed significant differences. We examined uh, many of them and we uh, ended up with a list, a very uh, a list of, uh, let's say, 10 genes which do change following social isolation. I'm going to give you only one example. Those five, dual specificity, specificity phosphatase five. This is a protein which is part of the ERK, uh, ERK um, pathway. ERK pathway is, is very important, is actually responsible for synaptic plasticity in many brain areas. Phosphor ERK is, phosphorylated ERK is going into the nucleus and activate a transcription. DUS5 is a negative feedback of the system. It's actually transcribed by phosphor ERK and it's a dephosphorylating ERK and inactivating it. And, and DUS5, as you can see here, is getting that the uh, results of the high throughput sequencing. It gets down for uh, already 48 hours following social isolation. And then we have done a, a new experiment with a new cohort of 10 animals per group in using a real-time PCR. And you can see that already 24 hours following a social isolation, there is a reduction of in, the, in the amount of DUS5 in the middle amygdala for a, something like half of the amount it was beforehand. And here is the relative a ratio of DUS5 in various brain regions. You see, you can see in the cerebellum, it's very high, actually the highest in the brain. And when you normalize these, all these regions and check it uh, 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 24 hours after, after further isolation, you can see that actually in all the brain, there is a reduction in the induced five expression. This is one example, and there are other um, examples with different patterns just as well. And what does this mean, I think? It means something very interesting to me, okay? It means that we, I mean, we tend to think about ourselves as individuals, as uh, independent individu individuals. Okay, the brain of us is working the same w whether we are here or there, whether we are with people or, or alone. Okay, the, the environment can change, the environment can give us all kinds of stimuli, but we are the same, we are the same people. And what we show here is that the very infra the infrastructure of the brain, okay, certain the expression of certain genes in the brain is changing already 24 hours following social isolation. So in a way, you, can, you, you may say that the brain is working differently in isolated animals as compared to animals which are within social environment. Okay, so mean, we may not, or we, I'm talking about, at least these mice are a little bit like, like bees or, or ants. They are social animals. And if they are isolated, they are not the same. They are not the same. They are changing. The brain is changing, and we have to take it in account. Um, we may not be just a group of individuals. Maybe we may be more social than we think of, even in the uh, terms of the activity of our uh, brain. And um, the last, just uh, one uh, future, future direction to, just to, to be able to play with oxytocin vasopressin and with the, in the brain, we have uh, created a, our own transgenic mouse uh, which express three recombinants uh, in a uh, coupled to the oxytocin gene and flip recombinants under the ex uh, regulation of the vasopressin gene. You can see here the uh, staining of the Cree uh, dependent uh, expression of, e uh, of YFP in the PVN. You can see that it's uh, non, not overlapping with the vasopressin cells, which are uh, standing here in red, but they are show over a uh, complete co-localization with the uh, oxytocin cells. And uh, we would 
we, sh we should be able, using viral injections of the newly uh, uh, created, you know, uh, optogenetic and pharmacogenetic agents uh, that are uh, all the time developing, we should be able to, de to manipulate differently oxytocin and vasopressin cells in the, in the PVN and to check what is exactly what is the uh, re uh, re relations between them. Uh, and, um, and I would like to thank the, uh, all the foundations that contributed somehow, sometime to this um, uh, research, to, the, to our collaborators, and um, especially to Yossi Arom, of course, that, uh, that not only uh, I started with, but uh, I keep working with and uh, uh, with a lot of uh, joy, and to uh, the rest of uh, my students and the lab manager and to the animals, of course, that we are uh, using. Thank you very much. Well, the rats are nicer, <laughs> really. I mean, their uh, behavior is much more uh, uh, relaxed and uh, predictable. Uh, they are, of course, bigger, more, much more convenient to uh, inject or cannulate or to record from specific brain areas and so on. Um, and I think that now that the barrier to create transgenic rats was broken, I personally would prefer working with rats uh, rather than mice. But Still, mice are easier to make as a genetic model, so we uh, work with them either. Rats also another another advantage is that they when when you let them meet male with ma male with male they do a lot of vocalization that mice do not do uh, they, unless they have a female in the in the area, and we think we are now starting to use vocalization as another uh, dimension of the behavior, and we see very interesting thing that happen in this dimension, so we, we are very satisfied with rat as a model. I, I have a problem with this. I know, I know. Part of it, but not with isolation. Okay. If you take me and you put me in isolation for a week, mm -hmm. I'm going to talk with anyone that I know or I did know and nothing. You interpret that as lack of memory. No. There's nothing to do with that. Of the animal. But I showed and you. And a friend after a week in isolation is going to talk with him. Here, this experiment is, is actually showing exactly the opposite because these, these rats, okay, they are in seven days of isolation and still they prefer investigating a novel uh, stimulus over a familiar one the, day, the memory of which, of which they acquired seven days earlier. Okay, so it's not their behavior which is changing, it's the memory. That's it. So it's not isolation, isolation doesn't cause, it's not, it's not. But, yeah. but the idea to measure the interaction and the indication for memory, I'm not sure it's, it's right to do it. Yeah. Uh, okay, maybe. The, the other question. Yeah. That's why we need the vocalization. I mean, we but. Have to meet in five minutes. Yeah, I know. <laughs> the other question is, what's the capacity of the system? How many animals? I don't he know. How many? Day, so he has How many he people? Knows does only one, two, five, twenty-four. Only one at a time. How many people can you remember mm -hmm. without your cellular phone? No, well, after twenty years, you won't remember many. <laughs> Depends on when when you uh, when you met them. I mean, I, I, for example, I mean, we are going to something else. That I, I, I have no idea about uh, mice. I know that in, in people. I mean, if you talk about take a, talk about facial recognition. I have a problem with face recognition. There is a dyslexia. To face. It's now well known. Ten percent of the population is lucky is having problems with face recognition. One percent almost does not remember faces at all. But there are absolute remember uh, 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 people which remember it absolutely. My wife, for example, can tell me. You see this guy? I took a bus with him ten years ago to 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 Harvard's of him campus or something like this. Really, I mean, she she. That's memory, it's a... Uh, no, the, the problem is, it's not the capacity, it's important because... Why, why does it important? Because you, you want to put 
no modulator of the flow, CRA or oxytocin is the main factor. And uh, to the best of my knowledge, they are not specific for a certain cell. They yeah. treat out the things all over the amygdala or whatever. So how they affect only one without the other, or they affect everyone? First of all, they can affect only the cells which express the receptor. Only the one that you last learned? Maybe. I mean, first of all, they can express, they can uh, work or influence only cells which express the receptor. And that may not be the say all these cells, this one. And second, they can, ex they may influence uh, more, okay, cells which were active recently, or cells which are going to be active in a few minutes, or cells uh, it, it certainly which express force, for example, or something like this. Okay, so coincidence of stimuli can work in, bio in the biochemical pathways not less efficiently than they work in, in the electrophysiological uh, pathways. So the specificity is due to the cell being active. Exactly. Ex exactly. exactly. And then you would affect only some cells that were recently active. And that, that, that's why you would remember one animal very uh, in a, a bitterly and one animal very uh, sweetly. Colostrum is a great, uh, great thing. So, so how does it interact? I don't know. I, we know very little about the colostrum except that it, it, it actually uh, collects information from so, so many brain areas. Uh, we know that it is, for sure, that it is activated, strongly activated during social uh, interactions, and that it's one of the areas in the brain which gets the densest uh, innovation of oxytocin uh, fibers. That's all I can tell you about it.